Welcome back to the Citizen TV Town Hall. We're talking matter security, a little bit about arming private guards, Nyumbakumi as well. Let me read two of your SMSs real quick. Alex uh, here on Twitter says, yes, private guards should be armed. We live in a neighborhood where getting access to illegal firearms by criminals is much easier from neighboring states. While Abel Kuwait says, the government has spent a lot of money to train NYS officers. Why not give them more training and the guns instead of leaving them to stay free? Those are some of your thoughts. Keep talking talking to us 22422 is our sms line and use the hashtag monday report all right so we continue the discussion with my panel here and my the audience will also weigh in in just a bit let me bring in tabitha mwangi and what i want to find out from you tabitha is as a researcher where do we go wrong from a research perspective as a country mm. whereas over the last nine years or so we're looking at about 321 incidents of terrorism that's almost one attack every nine days or so mm -hmm. please talk to us about that uh, thank you, Vahika, for the question. Uh, from a research perspective, I think some of the mistakes that Kenya has been making has been, one, the issue of the information that the public has about what terrorism is, what security looks like. We have a tendency to often do certain things that are supposed to keep us safe, but after a few days we give up and just let go of that. So we lack that culture of discipline and consistency. So for instance, when an attack happens, when you're walking into a mall, everybody will be checking you. When you're walking into a bank, everyone will be checking. But then a month later, when you go to a Matatu bus stop and you're supposed to be checked, you're thinking, this guy is wasting my time. Uh, something else that we do wrong is we fully do not understand what terrorism is all about. Mm -hmm. So there's still a lot of myths in the population about what a terrorist looks like. So for instance, after the incident at Dusit happened, people were shocked that we would have someone like Kishunge or Kemunto or any other Kenyan name um, that is not often associated with terrorism because we tend to associate terrorism with certain sections of the there population stereotypes. yeah which is not actually correct because if you look at what is happening in kenya and even outside kenya there has been a shift to have locals carrying out attacks in their own country so if we keep thinking that a person called say hassan or abdi or Mau, 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 um Ab or halima will be the terrorist then we will we lose focus completely because it can be anyone Okay, and it's yeah. interesting because I want to bring in Dr. Salim Demo now for this. Mm -hmm. Former member, Nyumba Kumi. <laughs> Nyumba Kumi's success is, for some, a debatable issue. Because let's talk about the example of Gishunge here. Perfect example. He lived in Mushada for about three months. Neighbors noticed certain things about this particular individual, but nobody saw the need to escalate it. How should one look at situations like that when we talk about a country that should have been entered into the Nyumba Kumi system, uh, Dr. Demo? Thank you, Waiwa. Uh, actually, the recent case uh, regarding uh, uh, Ali Gishungi, Gishunge uh, shows that usually the terrorists are concerned with one aspect, that is getting access to the target. They don't care what happens thereafter. Now, because of that, they usually take a lot of time to plan. And in all the cases here in this country and elsewhere, mm -hmm. the citizens know and they suspect, but they don't say. Why? One of the reasons that uh, uh, when we went around the country uh, that was advanced was that you report you may be betrayed and then endanger yourself. But betrayed by who? By the police? Yes. Okay. Or whoever you are reporting to, whether it's the police or somebody else. Now, then we introduced an anonymous platform called Mulika Walifu. Mm -hmm. This one you will give information without endangering yourself. Now, one other thing, I don't know whether it is our national attitude it is not so much of fear because I almost all the incidents, citizens give detailed account on the cameras. So we cannot say they fear to talk to the police. They should give this information to the police. Okay. And I want to bring in Millicent for this one. Community policing, the gap between police and the citizen. How big is that gap? What needs to be done to bridge it? Just give us your thoughts on that. Well, I think uh, 
as Kenyans, and I think many citizens, there is lack of trust. We suffer from a trust deficiency uh, because we just don't know uh, whether we can trust the police and whether the police can trust us. We forget that the police is actually the public and the public is actually the police, except they have a designated role that they have to play for the good and the welfare of every citizen. And, and I think uh, in some instances we have had cases uh, where community policing, because community policing structures were supposed to work hand in hand with the Nyumbakumi, and in some cases you find that there are two parallel, you know, systems or mechanisms that are working. Each of not, them with their own yes, purposes. Yeah. Of and also not, not very well coordinating with, with the police. And I think even in the police, there was that realization that even the police system itself uh, was not coordinating very well, and hence the need for the multi agency uh, team that is now being. Um, coordinated at the county level, at the sub-county level, and the, because the community policing work at the sub-county up to the village level. So I think um, what our experience has been, in areas where there's been a lot of awareness creation, as uh, uh, Tabitha said, Sometimes we find research and we don't use the findings. Okay. There have been lessons that are learned. If those lessons are given to the community policing members and the public is also uh, sensitized, and then the bridging the gap between the police so that it is more service-oriented and not control and force and intimidating. So, so policing, therefore, doesn't become securitized or militarized, mm -hmm. but they become like part of, of the society. And in our case, sometimes in Kisumu, people used to say policing ni wewe, policing ni mama yako, policing ni baba yako, mm -hmm. amani yako, usalama wako, ni jukumulako. So we are all, you know, we are supposed to work. But in cases where there's been betrayal, when somebody reports a case, mm -hmm. and then the, the, there's a leakage, or there's the institutions are not strong enough, and the individuals are not responsible enough to protect the, the whistleblower, mm -hmm. then the, the trust completely goes and, 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 and that is where the problem lies. Gaining that is practically impossible. We know I've yeah. seen you scribbling quite some notes. I'll give you a chance to speak. But let, let me get some questions now from our audience here. They've been patiently waiting. First on with a question and I have Josephine here who will take that mic around. Josephine, I think there's someone next to you who's ready to ask a question. Just introduce yourself and please ask your question and let us know who that question is uh, directed to. Uh, um, working with the uh, uh, private security. Go ahead. Bob Morgan security. I want to ask a question from the side of the government, police force or these other organizations, who is cheating the other? We can number very many issues of, or incidents. The police are getting uh, information. Other arms are getting these uh, research, research um, materials. How long is it taking for the government to assist or to take precautions? So you feel they are not working together or information is not getting to the right people or action is not being carried out once information has the been The information received. is there, but there is a gap. Okay, there's a gap. Hold on there. Okay, let's get one more question. So those are two questions, then I'll give my panel a chance to respond. Josephine, can you please take that mic round to that side there? Uh, there's a lady at the corner there who can also ask a question. And then we can get a quick response from my panel here. And of course, you can keep talking to us on 2242, our SMS line. Use the hashtag Monday Report, and we'll also try and get some of those messages as well. Go ahead. Thank you very much, Mr. Moderator. My question is to Eric Okeo. And my question, Eric, is this. Given that we know the focus now is on police reform, a reform that is going to see better quality and not necessarily more numbers, we see a role for private sector security workers in supporting security nationally. My question then to you is on the act. Are there plans in place to begin to deregulate the act so that an increasing role of private sector security workers can come on board in a stepwise incremental manner, perhaps from county to county or from community to community with a proper training program in place to capacitate private sector security workers to support us nationally in the quest to fight what we are seeing as increasing insecurity and the threat of terror. Thank you. Thank you very much. Panokio, because that question is hot and fresh, I think you, you respond to that first <laughs> before I give uh, the spokesperson a chance to respond as well. Thank you very much, uh, Ambassador Dr. Diambo, for that question. 
I mean, it, it brings to light the reality. And that's why I said when I, in my opening remarks that speaking for employers, we support the idea. We think it is a good move to, to, to consider the first arming of our officers. But then when you go to the act, it is very express. It says this cannot, be, cannot happen, which means the reality then is that for now, this thing is illegal. In it fact, it doesn't matter how long we sit here and discuss it. It is illegal. Pros and cons. It's so, illegal. So, to answer Daktari's question, uh, what the conversation we intend to begin as the Kenya Security Industry Association employers, and we have a meeting tomorrow of the Governing Council, is to lobby the the National Assembly because we are an act. We are a body created by Parliament, so we'll have to lobby Parliament. That's where we started with uh, our partners, the Kenya National Private Security Workers Union and all of us, go back to parliament, get parliament to agree. It is tabled, it is passed, mm -hmm. the president signs. Then that's the time the board then will be able to, 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 to work together with police and uh, the Central Firearms Licensing Bureau to look at the aspects. So that if we start here to say one in one or two months mm -hmm. uh, with this act being here, uh, th the reality is obvious. So our, 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 the door we will begin knocking tomorrow should be the door of the National Assembly. The door of the National Assembly. Yes. Okay. When a spokesperson come in, two quick questions. Someone there asked about a gap. Information is conveyed. Maybe no action is taken or it's not received by the right parties. Secondly, we also got a we also had a, a thought here from one of our panelists about uh, the, the police's approach, sort of m from militarized perspective, that might make some people afraid to volunteer information to the police. Feel free to respond to all of those questions, please. It's okay. Thank you so much. I think uh, the most important approach is that uh, many a times there has been that tendency of we versus them or them versus we. Mm -hmm. Many of us do not understand that police is an institution created by the people of this country. That there is need to have a policeman to undertake safety and security of the country and more so matters to do with the interior, the, the, the internal affairs and security issues of the country. That's the role of the police. So first of all, it's important to look at the police as an institution created by you for the purpose of your safety and security. And you don't need to treat police as others. People think maybe a policeman has come from the moon and is a unique person, is a strange person. You are our fathers, our brothers, mm -hmm. our mothers, and this is just a job. Just like there's division of labor in society, there's a teacher, there's a doctor. But most interestingly is that police have been given a lot of powers. And the, the basic power we always talk about is a policeman has authority to stop, search, and even detain. If that power is not used appropriately, then it brings in the issues of mistrust. Okay. And most importantly is the issue of trust has been the gap, especially in matters community policing. Mm -hmm. Because community policing is just a matter of individuals, the public looking at avenues and means of ensuring their safety and security. What role do you play? And I give very simple examples. When you are in a village and you have a farm, the first priority would be, can you fence your farm? If you fence your farm, it means that your neighbor's cow will not stray into your farm and therefore right. would not have conflict. If you secure your door appropriately, and that is why you see technology, things like CCTVs now coming in and so on and so forth. 